Cool. So I uh, don't have don't have any big plans for today. It's just one of those those random days. So we can just do Q and A Q&A or whatever we feel like. If anyone wants, wants to play some mods or or anything, I can give a little update about what I've been up to for the last the last week or two. Um, one sec. I'm gonna open my door. It's a little extra echoey in here. Let's see if that'll help. There's some sort of like moving truck or something outside. So uh, I was closing my door to try to like cut down on noise, but it seemed to make it extra echoey. So yeah, random day, woohoo. Or I guess woohoo, I don't know. Um, so yeah, what I've been up to is um, the big, well the, Current thing I'm in the middle of is the 1728 update, which is turning into a pretty uh, pretty big update. I was doing a, a size comparison, like the change log for 1728. Um, it's not as big as 1720. That one was huge, but there's still quite a bit of stuff here. So uh, the the main gist of it is just like rewriting or kind of cleaning up a lot of you know like the SDL stuff. For those of you who know what that means, just like the the input handling and the, the like the low level code that just like deals with like reading events and then like drawing in OpenGL and then reading events and drawing in OpenGL and stuff like that. Just kind of like the the kind of the, the main event loop of the game, which is super, super nice to have that like cleaned up and understandable. Uh, so that's, yeah, it's basically involved kind of like <laughs> ripping all the platforms apart a little bit and then putting them back together in kind of a, a clean way. Uh, so the, the thing I'm working on right now to be specific is the Mac version. I'm trying to get, uh, like the official like store Mac version kind of back back to being up to date. Um, so I have my little checklist of to do things for, for the Mac builds. So I get wire up in app purchases and game center. And there's a few minor things here for uh, getting it to show the, the correct buttons on controllers and things like that. So uh, yeah, so once I get this done, my plan is to hopefully update update the Mac App Store version. Uh, the nice thing about a lot of that code is because uh, Apple platforms, they're pretty unified now to where like if you're writing code that works on a Mac, it'll usually, in most cases, or a lot of cases, it's the same code that'll work on a iPhone or iPad or, you know, like all the, all the different Apple platforms. So it's kind of nice to like get some of that work out of the way, <laughs> just getting, you know, Game Center and, uh, you know, purchases and stuff like that working. So then that'll work on when I finally do launch on, on iOS. Uh, that stuff will be ready to go, which is good. Um, so yeah, that's 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 what I'm up to. I, so I got to finish those last few checklist things, and then um, I still need to put the Android version back together. It's still ripped apart on the operating table. So if you go to ballistica.net downloads, you'll still see that uh, Android version is conspicuously absent from the 1728 test builds. Um, but that one should be nice and like tidied up too. So I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that. Uh, you know, it might fix some weird like launch hangs that some people have, or you know, it might just behave a little bit better. Um, certainly, the code will be cleaner, so if it is having problems, I can probably diagnose them better. But, but yeah, so then that'll be the that, that'll be the next thing as soon as I get the Mac build patched back up. Um, so at this point, it's decently stable, or at least it should be. So like, if you're using like PC test builds, uh, please let me know any problems you're running into. I know. I've heard about it, you know, people running into crashes and stuff. So, you know, if if you can reproduce any problems that you're running into, like, please let me know. Uh, I'd like to start getting things polished up. There's a decent amount of like churn with, you know, like the the controls that are in there for high frame rate or being able to, you know, run the game at any frame rate. Like that wound up, you know, breaking certain things. Like there were certain display things that just like made the assumption that the game runs at 60 frames per second or something close to that. And so then suddenly when the game is running at like 120 frames a second, or if you, you know, turn off max FPS and it's running at 600 frames a second or a thousand, like that wound up actually causing some weird visual issues, like things flashing too fast and stuff like that. So slowly but surely getting all that stuff cleaned up. Uh, so if you see any stuff like that too, like if you have a high frame rate monitor and the game is you know, glitching out in some weird way or something just happens too fast, uh, you know, please holler. So, so hopefully we can get this 1728 build nice and clean and, and released to everyone before here before too long here. Uh, speak to you on mail about spin-off game stuff. Oh, like how to use the spin-off system? I, um, 
I mean, feel free to send me an email. I can try to respond uh, if I have a chance, but I still, like, that's still on my mental to-do list is getting, like, an example of uh, how to use spinoff to, like, make your own little app out of Ballistica stuff. Um, one, of the, one of the things I plan to do with it, you know, hopefully not too long, far out, as I mentioned, is uh, redo the, um, the BS Remote app, you know, just the little phone app that lets you use your, uh, your phone as a controller. I want to kind of build that out of Bomb Squad code or out of Ballistica code. So it's basically sharing the same code with like the on-screen controls. Uh, so I think that would be a, I feel like that would be a really good, uh, you know, just test case for doing a, a spin-off app that is not <laughs> Bomb Squad just to kind of, you know, dog food it, as they say. That's the term dog fooding is used in development where it's like you're eating your own dog food uh, to where it's like you're, you're building a system, but then you're like using it for something that you use yourself. So that would be a, a good dog fooding example for, for spinoff. But I should get like a proper tutorial in there and, um, you know, just step by step people can go through just to show you how it's supposed to work. <laughs> and then making it run on a smart fridge. That will be uh, the absolute next thing on my list. Once the toaster is fully supported, you know, I, I feel like, you know, a toaster is a... Well, I don't know. Uh, smart fridges or toasters? Uh, which of those are a big mark, bigger market? Good question. Oh, microwave builds. Yes, so many, so many things to take into account. Or electric toothbrush. I'm like maybe electric toothbrush could be a good one too. I'm trying to think of other, other things that have like way more technology than it seems like they would need in them, like electric toothbrushes or. Hmm. I'm trying to think. What's the most ridiculous thing that is like there's a high tech version of it? like an electric razor or something or you know something that has like an app associated with it like my uh, my smart <laughs> my smart coffee mug here where I can go into my app and like adjust the temperature of it I still feel kind of bad because I was switching up my coffee mugs all the time for like fun different ones with different things on it and now I just use this smart one all the time and I'm extremely boring smart water bottle there we go Oh yeah, I think I feel like I asked about this before, but I don't remember. Like, are there super advanced calculators now, or are there even calculators now? Because it seems like there's there's almost like no reason for calculators to exist. You know, it seems like just write an app for a phone. Like, is there anything a calculator would do that people wouldn't you know be able to do on any phone? Okay, interesting. Yeah, it just uh, that seems like such a kind of a weird thing where it seems like there's no technical reason for calculators to exist, but I guess you know there might still be you know certain reasons for almost like legal reasons or like you know they would have just the stuff you could use for like math tests or something, but not you know other functionality to where schools would still require them or something. I don't know. But I mean, yeah, a, cal a calculator like any smart calculator is basically. It's always just been, you know, a really weak processor, right? So it's just like a really, really weak little computer. Um, so, I mean, a, a smartphone is a not so weak little computer. So it seems like there's, I can't think of anything that, you know, a, a calculator would do that a, a phone couldn't, you know, if you just wrote an app to do the stuff. I guess just having like dedicated buttons, maybe that makes it like faster to use or something. Okay. Anyway, enough about calculators. Or yeah, that's what I was like for exams, you know, stuff where it's like, you're allowed to have this limited subset of, of stuff, but not a full phone where you could, you know, like just store all the answers on there easily. I guess people figure out how to do that with calculators though. Well, I'm old. Like I, I remember, you know, when I was in high school, it was like the TA 85s. Uh, there's certain, they were even, I think they had like the same processor in them as like the original Game Boy or something like that, you know, and some people would like write in assembly language and make little like Tetris clones and stuff like that for them. Um, so it was kind of cool, like learning to program your calculator. I never like learned to do like assembly and like the super fancy stuff, but I think I like wrote some really simple like scripting stuff for it. I don't remember. It's been a while. Uh, how's work on update going? I just did that. Did you just join? <laughs> the update is coming along. The um, this update, which is, this kind of seems to happen randomly where like an update just turns into like a big update. You know, like 1728, it was just gonna be like a bug fix update. And then uh, 
suddenly I just started like cleaning up the event code and then that turned into, uh, you know, like rewriting the OpenGL code and, or not rewriting it, but you know, like taking out the old stuff and updating to OpenGL ES3 and things like that. So things just kind of like snowball. And then I have to like catch myself at some point and be like, okay, let's, let's wrap it up. So I'm, I'm hopefully, I'm approaching the let's wrap it up phase of 1728. Uh, like I said, it's got some really nice cleanup stuff in here, so I'm I'm very happy that I you know took the time and did the the cleanup stuff. Um, mainly, like if you haven't played around with it, if you're running like the SDL version, the SDL version is any like basically desktop version. So if you're running Linux or the Windows versions, um, or if you build the Mac version yourself, you're getting the SDL version. But if you come into like Source, Ballistica, Base, so there's these new things called app adapters, and this is basically like talks to there's one that talks to SDL, and then there's like, this is what I'm working on now, which is like the Apple one, which talks to like Coco or UI Kit, which is, you know, Apple's kind of official stuff. But if you come in and play with like App Adapter SDL, this is kind of, it's kind of neat. You can see just how things work, like at kind of a high level. There's somewhere there's like just the event loop. Run main event loop. There we go. Yeah, so this is, you know, I know, I know I've pointed this out before, but it's just kind of neat to see like this, this fundamentally is how an app or a game or whatever works. It's just like, well, not done, do this loop. You know, so we ask SDL for any new events that have come in like keyboard presses or joystick events or whatever. We handle those events. And then we draw the game in its current state. And then maybe we sleep for a few milliseconds and then we do it all again. So it's just like, this is fundamentally what, uh, what an app does. I mean, different, different systems, it works in different ways. Like, like one thing that's kind of interesting is with SDL, like you were explicitly running a loop. Um, like, so some, this is almost like an older style of doing things. It's like, while not done, just do this loop. So the, the code is like totally in control of like the loop. But on other systems, like on Coco or uh, UIKit or on Android, it's set up more like where you, you don't actually manage this loop yourself. Like your, your program launches and it, you register things saying like, hey, when you're gonna draw a frame, like call this function, or like when a keyboard co event comes in, call this function. And like, you never actually do like one of these while loops. You basically just like, it's like the UI system like talks to you, you don't talk to it. Or, you know, it, it kind of like, you wire up stuff and that gets called when things happen. And that's, that's basically it. Whereas in kind of this more traditional type thing like SDL, it's like you're doing, you're doing everything yourself, so. I don't know, kind of interesting. But if you if you look around in some of these other ones, I think some of these are in public, some of them are not. Like App Adapter Apple, it's kind of like structured in a different way where it sets up callbacks and things like that. Um, so, so yeah. So this is kind of one of the new things in 1728. I think there are, this was spread out, split out recently is like adding this whole App Adapter thing, which just helps like keep a lot of this code clean. It used to be all like smashed together and so like there was stuff doing SDL with in like if statements, it'll like do the SDL part and then it would do like the Mac part and other if statements. And I feel like at some point things just get like unmaintainable if you have, uh, you know, if you write code that way, where it's like all the platforms are like smashed together. Oh, is this, what is this? <laughs> Man, Doom on a, what, what is this? Uh, Oh yeah! All oh, right, I had seen that. That is awesome. <laughs> Pregnancy test. See, that's a good ridiculous example. I mean, I guess it makes sense. You know, I'm sure like a, pro a low end processor like that is so cheap you can just like throw it in anything. But it just you know, in a way, it seems like why would you need that much power? Yeah, what are we? <laughs> Noise. Oh yeah, are TI-85 still a thing? Is that like, have they not replaced it with like a TI-9000 or something at this point? I think for me it was like a TI-81 or 82. I forgot what it was. Maybe 83. I had it up until, I, I had my old like high school calculator up until some point. I, I think I wound up throwing it away, but I should have kept it. Oh well. Speaking of throwing things away, so I've been doing a lot of, uh, 
you know, as part of redoing this Mac version, basically, uh, I've been wiring up, like Apple has this uh, game controller framework, which basically it, you know, it handles talking to like game controllers and also keyboards and other things like that. So I've had to do a lot of like digging into my old stash of controllers to just like test stuff. So it was like digging out my super old Logitech here. This was like the, I, these are the controllers I was playing like the original version of Bomb Squad on back in like 2004 with friends. Got like, you know, like six or eight of these. They were pretty cheap and like hooked it up into a giant USB hub. Um, or this thing, like this old like Microsoft Sidewinder from I think like 1997 or something like that, something ridiculous. So, but basically like plugging in all these old things to just like make sure, or see if they still work with the, the new game controller framework. Surprisingly, most of them do. Like it has been possible to get them working. Or This little thing, I love this, this little, uh, you know, 8-bit do, but it's basically a SNES looking controller with analog sticks added. Um, and then of course the common ones now, like Xbox and uh, just bought one of these actually just to test with that you know new PlayStation PS5 controller which is they're super slick I love it it just looks like sexy and futuristic <laughs> you know I mean I like the Xbox ones too because they're cheaper so I actually bought like more of them to actually play with friends or if I have the opportunity to like play with a group but the PlayStation ones are pretty cool looking um, but yeah anyway I speaking of pull this out of the trash but I was testing on this old thing, like some, it's like a Nyko something or other. But this thing's like 10 or 15 years old and whatever rubber is on it is completely like decomposed. So it's like, it's the stickiest, nastiest thing ever. <laughs> so I'm not going to keep this, this thing. Hopefully they, hopefully they found a better covering for their, for their other uh, game controllers. It bit do, okay. Cool. Yeah, I, I keep bouncing around. I, I feel like, I mean, I'm pretty happy with the, the new Xbox or uh, PS5 controllers, like just when I'm testing or just playing for myself or whatever. But but yeah, I'm always on the lookout for a, just a good controller. I did like the 8-bit do, like like this little thing, just because it's so small. So I could just like stuff it in. If I'm, you know, wandering around working at coffee shops for the day, I'll just, I can like stuff this in a bag really easily. So that, that part's nice. I also have an actual Super Nintendo controller, like, you know, like this minus the analog sticks. And then there's like an adapter that plug, you know, there's like a USB adapter for it. So there's something like that, that gets me super nostalgic. I can actually use like a Super Nintendo controller to like play the game. It's like, oh. It also, uh, oh man, I was digging through my controller code. It also makes me realize I really need to rewrite my controller code. Like it works for now, but it's it's so like crufty. Um, if you come into like Ballistica, base, input, device, it's joystick input.cc. Um, there's this goofy stuff in here. Like there's this like hold position. So if, <laughs> If you play on, I think the Mac version, I think it's just the Mac ver or not the the iOS uh, remote app. There's this weird thing where you can like use tilt controls, which is you know it's kind of like the fad at the early smartphone days. Um, but you can use tilt controls and it'll, like aim your character, but your character won't move unless you have your thumb down and then your character moves. So I had to like wire up this whole like hold position button, which is like a fake button. Which there's there's all this code to like deal with that, and that's only for like the iOS version of the remote app. <laughs> so, but it makes all this other code like harder to understand and just more complicated and stuff. So, uh, so yeah, at some point, I'm, I'm trying not to right now, but at some point I need to completely rewrite joystick input.cc just to make it sane. <laughs> um, so, there's a lot of stuff in here like the the game will do like auto calibration of you know dead zones and stuff like that. Because when I was uh, working on like the Ouya controllers and like some kind of quasi janky old Bluetooth, Bluetooth controllers, you know, they, they'd wind up having some uh, drift and whatnot. So I tried to like add automatic detection and, you know, filtering in here to handle with that, handle that kind of stuff. But in a lot of cases, that stuff isn't necessary anymore. Or, you know, in certain OSs, it'll handle it for you. So it's a, a yeah, complicated situation. And also there's stuff here where it does like SDL events where everything is 
based off integers. So like the max, um, the max value is like half of a 16-bit integer. So it's three two seven six seven. <laughs> you know, it's like it would be neater if it was just like from you know zero to one floating point values. Like keep everything more understandable. Um, so so yeah, it's so if you're looking through this joystick code, I apologize, but. It, at some point, this would be a good thing to clean up. But like I said, it's it's one of those things where like it works now. It's like a very polished turd. <laughs> it works, so I'm not gonna touch it. Uh, but at some point. What is this? Oh, that's cool looking. How about you folks? Are, um, are you all fans of you know the Xbox layout with the analog stick on top or the, the PlayStation layout with both of them kind of symmetrical? I'm definitely an Xbox layout person. Though like I said, I, I do, uh, I mean I'm fine with both and I, I, this does look like a very pretty symmetrical controller. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so bold. I've played, a lot. I've played a lot of controllers and be completely honest uh, okay so i played the 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 cheap knockoff ones i've played the xbox ones some some playstation and switch too uh -huh. and keyboard i'm game by the keyboard guy i can switch between no problem but xbox has always been my choice mostly because of the their bigger controllers i just have like i don't know if i have i have like if i have massive hands or something yeah or i just feel like i'm holding something but uh, the playstation controllers in comparison feel kind of kind of kind of well, maybe not cheap that's the that's a bad word because it implies it has bad quality yeah but it kind of feels small like it's made for baby hands i have no idea how to yeah a little bit i i was busting out my my ps3 controllers that was one of the first ones i used for you know playing with friends back in the day and unfortunately they don't really work anymore on modern mac os <laughs> but but yeah those definitely feel daintier like the i feel like the this newer one it feels a little chunkier a little beefier a little more xbox like but but yeah, oh, yeah, I totally see what you're saying. Have you ever used like the original Xbox controller, like this monster? <laughs> oh, I've heard horror stories about this one, yeah. Oh, I was gonna say, you might like it. If you um, if you like bulky actually, controllers, yeah. that thing was so bulky. Um, actually, I, actually, I, uh, actually, I probably wouldn't mind grabbing this one. Uh, yeah, because- you know, If there was like a modern version of that, or I, I could have a chance to like hold it in my hands and kind of make my- Yeah, like if you, have, if you enjoy big controllers, it was like the biggest of the big. I, I'm trying to find like, at some point they did like a revised version which is basically went down to the size of like that we know like is like an xbox 360 or you know the yeah, it's yeah. kind of the same size today yeah. still but but it, oh, <laughs> there's, this, there's this wikipedia link i think okay no uh, oh yeah yeah, the, the, yeah there's a couple of the images of the revised version if you look hard enough oh here this maybe, we, oh, maybe i can find it i think uh, i think this is it oh come on oh there we go <laughs> yeah you can see so that's basically yeah. this is kind of it's been the size ever since, but yeah. On the left is the original. That's the original, the yeah. Revival. Then there was the middle, which is the Exo 360. Yeah. So yeah, there's no, there's not there. I'm gonna find the revised version. It's oh, okay. Like, yeah, the revised version. The, yeah, I guess that was 360 sorry, probably. Oh, found it, found it. It's on Wikipedia. Oh, okay. Do you have it's a... super subtle. You, you might, you might not, you might even like be convinced this is the original model. Oh yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's like, like you can tell it's less like rounded. But yeah, it had. The, yeah, the original Xbox had those weird black and white buttons. They did change it a lot. Like that was one weird thing is like if you oh. look at the original, like the black and white buttons were up here, but then they like moved them oh, yeah. down here. So like switching controllers, it was not just a size thing. It was like the buttons moved. Yeah, um, yeah I'm so glad that it was replaced by triggers because those buttons are like super hard to press. I cannot really feel it. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't remember. I mean, I remember playing a lot of Halo with, <laughs> with this back in the day, but I don't remember what those buttons did. But yeah, I remember seeing this too, like the prototype PS3 controller, the weird boomerang thing that never really happened. <laughs> yeah. They wound up coming out with like, the PS3 controller looked just the same as like PS2 and PS1, basically. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so that was the size. The size is definitely more comfortable, but there's also another thing. The analog, the left analog is actually like on the left, like on the PS1 or PS4 and other, other PlayStation ones. Actually, they didn't change the layout in years. Oh yeah. The left analog is actually on the bottom of the pad. Uh -huh. And on Xbox, like uh, I thought, like to replace it with the D pad, and I think that's way more comfortable because sometimes when I switch my, uh, like when I have two analogs at once, like in a third person game or something, mm -hmm. I prefer my uh, fingers to be far apart. Like left analog is on the left and right on the right. Oh yeah. I can just like when they're close together, it kind of feels weird for me. Yeah. But when I play a third, third, uh, 
a platformer, I can just have the D-pad on left and buttons on right. Or when I play a third person game, I have two analogs and it's and it's like effortless. It, it, it feels like I have space on the pad. Yeah. yeah that's subtle, but it definitely contributes. I think and definitely feels more comfortable. Yeah. As for as for glyphs, uh, okay. So my my brother I used to play. Uh, we played a lot of emulators back in the day, and it was always weird when in the SNES games you accepted with the right button. Which oh yeah. Be a on Nintendo or Circle on PS One. Yeah. But I, I got used to it, and at some point, even if you play like PlayStation One games in Japan, they use a circle for accept. When while in the West and Europe, you use the the circle the square button. Yeah. No, not the square button, but the uh, you know the cross the cross button, which is on the bottom, the bottom face button. Yeah. And yeah, those are <laughs> those are changes. I mean, I can I can adjust pretty much instantly, puff puff puff. If you play a lot of these game types of games, but if you only play, like play Xbox games or always condition yourself to input that bottom is jump every single time. Yeah. And sometimes you might have some strange cases where, oh, I'm playing an RPG, but, 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 it focuses, but for some reason, the button button makes me go back instead of go forward. Like, what is this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, how is it? So I know Nintendo is like, whenever I'm on the Switch, you know, I have to like condition myself, or recondition myself, because yeah, back and back and enter, you know, in the UI is opposite from what I'm used to. Is PlayStation that way too, or are they, because I'm looking... Actually, like, like I mentioned earlier, if you play the PlayStation 1 game, it depended on if the game is Japanese or uh, American. Okay. In America, you accept with uh, cross. If it's Japanese, you accept with circle. Okay. I don't know if that's the case with PS4 games and they're, and they're like, maybe maybe they uh, they change the standards to be completely cross, like cross every single time accepts and Nintendo stuck it to its like uh, roots. Yeah. And, uh, so I speak. Yeah, that's interesting because yeah, like looking at this controller, like the X is on the right, O is on the bottom, but like you know, I got my modern one here, X on the bottom, O is on the right. So yeah, I'd, I would be curious like the history of how these changed or what what people want or whatever. That that also means like at some point I have to I know like in Bomb Squad it's kind of hard coded where uh, you know the bottom button and right button are like enter and cancel for UI stuff. So I guess I would you know if porting to the Switch I'd have to <laughs> like somehow detach that to where that could be reversed. Yeah, like uh, like when you have Steam input, for example, there's like, for example, you have two modes, which is like menu and gameplay, and you could have different buttons for like accepting and going back and stuff. If people are playing on Switch, then you're right, you probably have to like port it to make people, you know, uh, be familiar because they're familiar with right button being accept and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, uh, it's not a big deal, but people get used to it. And I witnessed that firsthand with my brother. He doesn't play as much games as he did back, back in the day, but he did have some rules internalized. He still has that like game design lingo that went into his head. He knows what a health bar is. And uh -huh. he knows that the bottom button accepts menu. So it's wrong, <laughs> you're, you're, it's a bad game. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm sure like, I, I feel like, I would guess Nintendo probably like rejects you or something or gives you feedback if you have that backwards. I'm sure they want to have like a consistent experience. So uh, I, would, yeah, I, would, uh, I would guess. Uh, so, so PlayStation at one point just embraced that most, most, most people prefer bottom to accept yeah uh, and, and they basically stuck to their ways because they don't want to uh, you know confuse people yeah i mean sony probably did that uh, choice like early on probably in the playstation 3 era because some playstation 2 games also accept with circle yeah and sometimes i don't and they're very rarely even american games do this yeah so so it's not uh, localization like i play uh, i play some obscure like playstation 1 game that's in japan and only in Japan, and that is a circle, for example. But I don't know if there's like games that are like released for both regions. Do they, they swap the buttons to make it consistent with the region, or is it always like cross or circle to accept? Like, do they have to take, make a choice, or do they like purposely change buttons depending on region? That's a, that's something I didn't actually check. That's a good question. Yeah, that's another. That brings up another question: is um, like when you see. Like, uh, like in UIs, it says like press this button to, you know, to do this. Um, I know like some games, maybe on PC or maybe, or, well, I don't know. It's like you you can just show a little diagram of like you know the diamond and like just press the bottom button. You know, it's less about like oh press A or B or square or X. It's just like I'm wondering like do people prefer prefer that or because I I know like if I see A or B, I, like I have to look down at my like, controller and see like which one am I using. You know, it's like that A is on the right, B is on the left. Come over here. You know. A is on the left, B is on the right. Um, 
It's like a... Oh, then I'm gonna tell you something interesting. Check this out. So I have this Bluetooth controller, the HP Ultimate Bluetooth controller, which uses the Switch layout, right? Uh -huh. But it acts as an Xbox controller. So the game says press A, I instantly press the bottom facing button and it works. Yeah. So I don't have my controller, I just internalize, okay, this game uses a uh, Switch layout. Okay, this game uses Xbox. Okay, this game uses Sony. I can just, my mind doesn't need to think about which button to press because I know, okay, this is bottom, this is left, this is right, this is top. Oh yeah. And 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 when it comes to like, uh, you know, if it's like a, like a bumper or a trigger, right trigger, right bumper, one, two, uh, this is also standard across all like versions, like uh, on PS2, on Switch. I don't even know if even Switch has like uh, triggers or if it only has left and right. Probably has only left and right. Oh, uh, right, yeah. Sony, they use the same system. So, so RT is R2, uh, LT is, is R, L2, you know. Uh, that's mostly play PlayStation and Xbox changes. Yeah. It's consistent. You can basically have like a you can kind of like learn the differences and have them like make it instinctual. I don't even look at my game, but when I play games, I just see press the button. Okay, I know which one that is. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, in, in general, I've tried to, uh, you know, for the controller configs and stuff, you know, it's just like show everything in the diamond. So it's less about like what the heck this button's called and more yeah. just like press the bottom one. Um, the only downside is like you get the occasional, like when they did the, the port, I did that port for that like arcade system back there. It's like when, you know, that has like six buttons like this, you know? So it's it's like in those occasions, it's kind of a misleading because then you don't know which button is where or something, but. Um... Oh, it actually reminds me of a story. Uh, I remember playing the Pink Puffer platforming game on PC. It was back in the day as a kid. And this game, it was probably made on consoles and then on PC. And they don't use any uh, button glyphs, they use action icons. So when I first played the game and I visited the hub, I had no idea you could enter the, the, the doors and play a level because it didn't show a button prompt, in, it just showed the, the action icon. And I just huh. had to guess, okay, this means attack, okay, this means jump. So that was their way to not draw all the button prompt, they just made, so the game just, um, just in the back and either it's a PC game or it's a game at the game, you can just like, oh, you press this button and just show you some like internal code, like B, S, 4, okay, that's oh, button yeah. 4, whatever yeah. that means. Yeah. Because, you know, there's there's also the D input, which is a generic uh, stuff for every single gamepad ever that doesn't use the exit input standard. So, you know, that's also not very good. So I guess Foxcat could be that, but at the same time, I think it does this way better because, um, you know, when you join the game, look, it, it just shows you either either directly the prompt or just shows you the facing button. So it's left button, bottom button. It doesn't just show you jump or bump. Yeah. It just says press the button. Oh, like here, bump to the right, which is okay. So it says the action, but also shows you the button. That's cool. More people should, more games should do that. Yeah, I was trying to remember how I, <laughs> how I had that set up. Um... But yeah, I got to, uh, that's one of the, the other things on my to-do list with the new Apple framework is I think it might not matter, but I, I, I think they probably uh, frown upon like not showing button, like proper button titles. Like if you have a PS4 controller, they have like APIs you can use where it's like you can get the image for the, the actual button. So it'll show like, you know, the, the shapes for the PlayStation ones, stuff like that. So I, yeah. <laughs> I'll have to see if I can plug that in here somehow or other. For like people who have remapped things or something, maybe it would be useful. Yeah, so so the so the games either have to like uh, guess which which kind of buttons they use. For example, in some games, when you press the keyboard, it detects oh you're playing on keyboard, so we're just gonna switch the glyphs. You're playing on pad, so we're gonna switch to pad, right? Yeah. If you use Steam input, it can also detect what you're using. But at the same time, uh, you have to be careful because you don't want to change the keyboard when you move your mouse, uh, because some people want to play with gyro aiming, like a third person or first person game, and they wanna aim. So imagine the glyphs constantly shifting, like you press a button, oh, it's a gamepad. You move oh, yeah. your gamepad, oh, it's, oh, it's a keyboard now. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. annoying and ugly. Yeah, that's, that's but tricky. This, this game doesn't have camera mode movement, so... Yeah, I was going to say, that's, that's Bomb Squad's kind of <laughs> lux out there, where there's not really a case where you would want to use two controllers or a, yeah, a mouse and keyboard at the same time or something. Um, you do also have this uh, function, like two controllers is one, it's, which is probably, I, I think it's called co-pilot mode in, on Xbox or something like that. You can play a single person with two controllers or something like that. Yeah, I think that's built in. I, I read like on the new Mac version, Mac OS version, that's like built into the um, the OS somehow or other, where yeah, you can like merge merge two controllers, but that happens at the OS level. So it's not something that, 
that I have to deal with. It has it has something where you yeah. can uh, use a single controller and split that into like two controllers. <laughs> so that's like almost the opposite. Where if you, I actually I ordered some weird weird controller where it, you know it look it's like a wired controller. It looks just like you know kind of a, a cheap Xbox 360 controller, but it's just like one plug that goes to both controllers. <laughs> so I put that mode in there to support that weird thing. Uh, so you know you can plug one controller in and have it control two different characters. Actually, it reminds me of Overcooked, or or for example, if, if you kind of somehow uh, you know connect the Switch Joy-Cons and they somehow get you know uh, it as one controller or something. Yeah. But yeah, it's interesting. Like with the new, like the, this is the official Mac version. It's like it kind of takes it out of my hands. Where if you come and try to control it, it just says like Con configure in the system settings app. <laughs> so there's. Um, on the new Mac stuff, it's like... No, no that's an obscure pop-up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that is, that's that's true. That's kind of obscure. Um, but yeah, they have some sort of like remapping stuff you can do here or other... Burp, burp, burp. So, but the, the cool thing is if you remap stuff here, I guess it applies to like, you can have it apply to all your games or whatever, which is probably a better way to do something if you're plugging in some obscure controller. But um, but yeah, at the same point, my, my UI isn't needed. <laughs> Oh, by the way, um, there's um, actually Sock and me uh, are proud owners of the Steam controller. Oh, uh, cool! And, yeah. And, and, and I remember actually Sock playing Bobscat for a while using it, and he got some like, for example, in JRP, he had like a button which he could use to do a dash because it uses a button combo, and it was easier to put it into a button. So you can you know, use a button and just dash forward or something. Oh, like that. that's cool! I bought one. I have one around here somewhere. I never, uh, I never took the opportunity to like kind of you know, play with it and learn it and whatnot. But I just, I got one at some point. I was a little bummed though, then they like discontinued them and they're kind of not really a thing oh, anymore. Yeah, so, uh, but, but, but definitely the, the, the experiment paid, paid off because it gave people the opportunity to discover gyro aiming. Oh yeah. Even Valve didn't know, uh, they, they just put gyro because, okay, just let them have fun with the new toy or something. And it turns out it's amazing for uh, first person shooter games. Yeah, and yeah. Now, and, and now Valve made more controllers, more like, stuff even implemented flick stick which was like the system that some other guy decided to invent and create and now we can play first person shooters on pad and it feels fucking amazing yeah you can like aim you can up down uh, you know uh, it, you basically play twitch shooters on pad and for some and for some it might even feel better than playing mouse and keyboard yeah but yeah this pad oh and also uh, it moved to the steam deck which has which is basically an evolution of the steam controller and oh yeah nowadays, when I pop this controller up, I only do it when I want to have fun or want to try something new. Like I play some old game I know, left and right, like inside and out, and I just want to do something silly, like I play an entire game with it because it is fun. It is a new experience, but yeah, it is a learning curve and I'm not surprised people didn't really want to experiment with that. It's like a, if PC gaming was a controller, this was the controller. Oh yeah, yeah. It does seem to kind of yeah, fit with the... Fit with the, the mindset of PC gaming or something where it's like this this crazy you know like the touchpad oh, yeah. and all that or just being able to play like mouse based games with a controller like it seems like it was it was well well suited to what they were aiming for oh there it yeah, is yeah they, when they made the teaser for the steam controller they used uh, gameplay footage from city skylines uh, when when spy plays the game with the pad he explains city skylines and he, you can do some, some stuff like when you slide on the right pad you scroll but when you press on the pad and scroll, it actually, uh, instead of panning, you orbit around a point. So oh, you can have like, uh, you can do two stuff at once, uh, two things at once when you. That's cool. Stuff. Yeah, or, it does seem like there's probably some really like awesome ways to take advantage of those those yeah. inputs. It's just like, like you're saying, it's like almost too obscure, or, you know, too few people had that where oh, yeah. games aren't like gonna target yeah. that. But, but yeah, it's oh, yeah. a bit and, of a bummer. And in some other cases, but there was a pop person that really liked uh, messing with the controller and one situation she saw it was actually metal gear solid 5 where you could for example halfway press the trigger to uh, zoom and then press it fully to shoot right or for example where you can uh, when you press the uh, other trigger like slowly you do a crouch but when you press it like immediately fully you do a dive instead oh. so that's like, have, like multiple actions to the same button and it feels natural when you do cool but yeah, lots of experimentation needed and stuff like that. You have to get the config, the sensitivities and stuff. 
I, I, okay, I'm still not patient enough to do all this, but maybe one day I'll probably like learn the pattern so that I and actually love it. Yeah. Play everything on it. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of little things where it would be fun to, to play with them. I don't know, certain, even things I was reading about like the Mac controller framework, like it has support for like the weird, do you know like the weird sensitivity things in like the PS5 controllers where it's like the, the triggers can like, they can offer like yeah, yeah. variable resistance or something like, so it oh, almost yeah, feel like you're pulling a trigger or something. Like, or, 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 or a camera shutter or something like that. Yeah, or something like that, where basically you can just kind of control like the stiffness of the trigger, which seems like a, that could be a super cool thing to like take advantage of for something. Um, in the case of like doing a Mac game though or something, it's like what tiny percentage of people are gonna be playing on PS5 controllers. So like, I feel like it would be completely not worth it to like take advantage of that. It, it, just in general, talking about like cool features where it's like you wanna, you know, it's awesome to do something crazy and, and obscure, but it, it's a bummer when like so few people actually can, you know, see that. Um, or like making something that, you know, takes great advantage of the Steam controller or something like that. Um, Though, yeah. like you're saying, it kind of like turned into like the Steam Deck controller, you know, yes. kind of the same. Yes, because the, but, okay, so here's the thing. This story is quite very simple, but I'm going to quickly summarize it. So Windows 8 came out, Valve didn't like the direction that it was taking. So they tried to make sure that they, they could still play games, even though, even though Windows could, for example, become bad and unusable. So they put everything on Linux, then, okay, can we run games on Linux? Oh, now we can, we have Proton, okay. Can we have like a console experience with a PC? Okay, let's have Steam machines. Oh, but how do we play every single game with a single controller? Okay, Steam controller. Oh, do we have everything now? Okay, let's do Linux again, but this time make it better. So you can play games on Linux now, it is Proton. Okay, you have everything now. Okay, let's put all of that together and make a Steam Deck. <laughs> yeah, which is cool. It's I, like I'm, a I'm, I'm really hoping- I like a long journey, yes. Yeah, it does seem like it kind of all comes together in a way, and I hope Steam Decks are selling well. I mean, I, have, you, have you heard if they are? Uh, okay, so so it definitely sparked a lot of competition. For example, Asus made their Rogue Ally, and it's it's selling like hotcakes too. Mm -hmm. So Steam Deck was selling great, the Rogue Ally is selling really great. Okay. And it definitely encouraged people to like get into the market, sort of. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I would hope I would hope to hear that because. But, yeah. but I hear more about Rogue Ally nowadays than Steam Decks actually. Oh really? Well, in, in a way, like if it, you know, it's almost like if maybe that form anywhere. factor succeeds, that that's everyone wins, maybe, or you know, like if it encourages maybe more it. games to support like that that style. Yeah, like the main goal of Valve is to like make people use Steam, and Steam Deck does that. So oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's a win. I was happy when I finally got the game running on there, though it's not like running in the proper way. I need to. Uh, it does seem like getting getting games working well on Linux is tricky. <laughs> um, it is. Yeah, because it, it's super weird things, you know, like the, the big thing I've run into is if you compile a game with a new version of Linux, it like, it links it against like a, you know, a new version of like the libc API or glibc or something. And that means like anyone running an older Linux, it's not going to work for them. So it's like the, to get a game that works for everyone, you got to like link it on a very old version of Linux and, you know, just weird little things like that, or, you know, having different, different distros, having different you know, flavors of libraries and stuff like that. It's like getting something that works everywhere seems like just a, a pain in the butt. Uh, Steam has a bunch of right. instructions for doing that in terms of like, you're supposed to like build your stuff using, you know, like a Docker container that has their particular library set up and this and that. And so I need to, I need to dive into that at some point and just try to get a, yeah, a nice well, package no, Linux version. There's, nowadays there's Proton. So I wonder how well uh, Bonsap is gonna work if you run a Windows built through Proton on Linux. Oh yeah, my guess is it probably thing. works fine. So it sounds, I don't know if there's a good or bad thing, but it sounds like a lot of games, like they're just not even bothering with like proper Linux ports just because the Proton version works so well. So, uh, but I mean, maybe that's okay. Um, uh, in most of the cases it does, but it depends on the game definitely. And if you like competitive shooters and you use Linux, then goodbye, because most of them cannot run through Proton and anti-cheat isn't supported. I mean, the battle I people said that it should work. On oh, the yeah. Next, but... Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm sure that's such a moving target. Um, yeah, I... For indies, yeah, that, that's perfect. You can play anything, basically. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. It seems like one of those things where, you know, even if there are glitches or bugs, like if you're targeting that, if you're testing it on Proton, like you can find those glitches and work around them or whatever, you know, you could probably make it work pretty well. Um, it's like they're, what they're trying to do is like, you know, run games that have never tested on Proton and stuff like that. And they're doing a good job at that. So it's like, if something is testing for Proton, like that seems like 
you know, good thing. Um, yeah, when I was on Linux on a week, uh, I, I I got to play Jackbox Party Pack games, and uh -huh. it turns out the native implementation is worse than the Proton version. <laughs> For one simple thing, when you when you did full screen on the native version, the second monitor just died, huh. and it didn't do that on on the Proton version. <laughs> yeah, it does. It it does make me wonder certain things. Like one one thing I still need to wire up is <clears throat> like full Unicode support. So basically, talking to the OS to have it. Uh, like draw Unicode strings, like you know emojis or you know Chinese characters and things like that. Because the game, I looked into like trying to actually bundle like all characters I would ever need with the game, like as textures, and it's just like insanely huge number of characters. Like that's not viable. So it's like at some point you just gotta, unless there's some other trick I know of, but it's like, or that I don't know of, but you basically have to talk to the OS to get it to draw those characters for you. And I've, I've done that for Android and I've done it for the official Mac version, but I still need to do it for Windows, as probably a lot of you know, and Linux. So it's one of those things where, like, is it going to be worth, like, wiring that up uh, again for just Linux? Or should I just give people, like, the Windows version and have them use Proton? Um, and people probably still want to have, like, custom text or custom, like, fonts or something like that. So making it uh, part of the OS is going to probably be way easier because you could change that font to something else and it would just work. You don't have to redraw everything. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's in general. That's something where I, I mean, I'd need to. Let's see. Yet another thing on the, the list of things I need to improve or revisit is being able to like draw with different fonts, uh, stuff like that. For for just like the the console at the top of the screen, it'd be nice to have like a fixed width font for you know if you're. It just feels better for entering random Python code and stuff like that. Um, oh, and and if Ballistica is gonna become like an engine for more games, it probably would be a good idea to have other fonts than just Hobo. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I uh, so like okay, so Hobo, despite not being as hated as other other uh, fonts like Comic Sans, it's still on the list. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of like I'd like to revise things at some point. Man, I'm thinking maybe for a squads mode or something, maybe like swapping it out for like something that sort of maybe feels a little hoboish, but it's not hobo. Uh, so oh, yeah. we'll, we'll see. But yeah, just. At some point, I, that, that's something I hope to get in there, is just kind of generalizing the font stuff to not be locked to one font. <laughs> Bomb Squad Origins, oh, yeah. what is this? I mean, nobody, I, we, we like Hobo, okay, but... Yeah, <laughs> okay, so Hobo, so Hobo, Hobo is kind of, it's not as hated as Papyrus or Comic Sans. Oh yeah, yeah, I feel like Papyrus is just like, it's the Avatar font! Or, um, yeah, or yeah, Comic Sans, I feel like you, you can't use Comic Sans without getting uh, just ridiculed. Uh, unless you use ironically. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, you have to. So maybe it would work. We just embrace comic sans. <laughs> just yeah. Just just full yeah, ironic mode it, comic sans. Hobo is is not as hated, but it's still like in the background. It's kind of like hiding from the, in the shadows. Yeah, I do. Uh, I do get like a little annoyed when I see hobo somewhere. I'm just like, oh, like oh, I'm sharing a font with this, you know, like I don't know, some weird Chinese takeout, like restaurant down the street or something you know it's like oh, oh yeah yeah it wants to see it you see it everywhere yeah oh do oh do i pronounce sans sans like what this is one of those words where like i've i've read the word a million times sans sans <laughs> okay i don't even know what i should say it's one of those where i try to say it like really softly so nobody notices if i'm saying it wrong probably <laughs> but apparently <laughs> i got noticed Sans, sans. <laughs> I'm just gonna say it all ultra American. Sans, comic sans. That don't make no sense. Yeah, better. But yeah, there's certain um, nothing like one thing I don't like a little bit about Hobo is I feel like it's a little hard to read when it's super small. Like there's, um, which I I feel like didn't come into play until. Uh, you know, like people playing it on small phones and stuff like that. I, I kind of feel like there's some kind of simpler looking fonts that are just a little little easier to read at small sizes to where that, that might be good oh, for, yeah. you know, like tiny gameplay text, like names over your head and stuff like that. There might yeah. be something a little simpler that could work well. Um, oh, but by the way, fun fact, apparently, even, uh, even though like Helvetica is like considered the most readable font ever, uh -huh. and there's like some fonts for like dyslexic people and stuff, apparently Comic Sans was designed to be super readable. So every single like letter is like, has a unique shape and it's easy for kids to read and recognize oh. like why, why it got popular in the first place. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, because uh, with, with other fonts, sometimes letters are made in a way that they, they aid readability and quick reading and not really legibility. Oh, yeah. Which is kind of like 
a strange thing. Like sometimes I is like similar to L, but you don't notice that. You read uh, every single thing like in a. Uh, you don't you don't you don't read the single letters. You read the word or the sentence. So, so it's like easier to move from one letter to the next, from one word to the next, and just do it quickly. Yeah, I assume you've seen those weird weird things where it's just like a sentence, but like all the letters in the middle of the words are scrambled or something, and they're like you can still read this sentence, yeah. and it's like super easy to read even though it's like most of the letters are. Yeah, it's yeah, so weird yeah. like how our brains work like that. Yeah, most of that is definitely thanks to the phone because try reading papyrus. Papyrus is meant to look good or interesting instead of really good. So it's actually painful to read in papyrus. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's my, on my on my list sometimes actually, is to, to revise I, fonts. Uh, actually, we... We could, actually, we could try an experiment, but I'm gonna send you the results uh, after the fact. Now we can talk about something else because. <laughs> <laughs> uh... The one thing I, I was thinking of, um, I don't know if I still have my pipeline for. Um, let's see. If I, I guess these are probably drawn in flat mode, but you know, if you look at the actual the font sheets, you know, there's a slight bit of like clay texturing and and whatnot. So it's not just like a straight up drawn font and a little bit of like wavering or something. Like I did a little bit of filtering, probably not a ton, but to try to make them look uh, kind of clay-like. So it'd be cool to be able to do that with any font. It just makes me wonder if I just need to do like some, write up some like live filter to, to just run some sort of, or I guess you could maybe just do it in a shader or something just with like multiplying textures together. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think the original, like whatever pipeline I had that was generating the font files, I think that's long gone. So <laughs> I'll need to rewrite that. Um, or I think I was using like shake, which was like a, a an old you know, compositor from like 15 years ago that is no longer runs on like any hardware I have. Um, that's actually the case with a lot of my, my texture pipeline. So that's part of the reason I'm trying to get like the cloud asset stuff going is so I can actually like build new stuff and, you know, not have to like dig out a you know a 10 year old computer from my uh, closet that still has the software that needs there's needed to like compile those textures um 1.8 the font update comic sans everywhere it's coming oh, make it papyrus <laughs> oh yeah papyrus papyrus and comic sans so even avatar stopped using papyrus like you know things are bad when they like abandon their own font yeah they made like a custom one for the new movie yeah the awesome. second one it's like all chunkier and stuff Hey, can I actually pick Papyrus in Google Docs? I want to see. I can pick Comic Sans. That's easy. Oh, we got a question here. Stress test. Is stress test broken? I, I just fixed stress test yesterday. Like, it wasn't wired up because when I ripped out all this, like, SDL stuff and event loop stuff, um, that basically broke stress test. So I just kind of put it back together again as of this latest build. So around 21.551. Um, so you said change... Let's go with a small player count here. You said in 10 seconds. Okay, we should get two players for 10 seconds. Okay, so it turns out Google Docs doesn't have papyrus, so I'm gonna use maybe Writer or something. Cool, seems to be working. So yeah, yeah, try a new build. Uh, hopefully the Hopefully things are working now with that. Let me know if not. So, oh, you said, uh, what's the papyrus? You, Google Docs will not let you use it or what? Yeah, probably not. Okay, oh, I'm no. gonna have papyrus font download. Even Ruby Writer doesn't have it. I guess it has to be downloaded. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna download it, yeah. Free for commercial use, yay. Yay, papyrus should be free for all. <laughs> Everyone needs more papyrus in their lives. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. I have like a random piece of text mm -hmm. and I'm gonna cover it in papyrus and I wanna see if you can read it. And okay. Fast. <laughs> like, I'm actually curious how long it's gonna take. I actually haven't done it yet. I haven't tried it. <laughs> I, I didn't dare, but apparently it's like difficult. Okay, uh, just as follow a sec, I'm gonna apply it to my doc. See, let's see if the game actually. But oh there it is okay now i just have to apply it oh oh no uh oh oh no uh oh okay okay i'm gonna i'm gonna keep it 14 points just like the old text or 12 let me see what was the default i think it was 12 
or eight. Bracing for impact here. Yeah. It's not pleasant. I'm going to tell you that. It's not pleasant. <laughs> you can read it, but it's not pleasant. Like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, I feel like I enjoy looking at it, but not reading it. I just want to, like, look at it okay. like, a, like a piece of art. Okay, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm going to switch to Ariel, and I'm, and, and I'm, and I'm going to see if you can notice the difference. So that was Papyrus. This is Ariel. Oh, yeah. Just looking at them down at the corner of the screen here, it's like I'm not even going to attempt to read the Papyrus one. But, like, here I can read that pretty comfortably. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, so, oh geez. Yeah, so that's where I feel like Hobo is, it's not nearly as bad as Papyrus, but I feel like it's, a, it's readability is not, not quite as good as, you know, a nice, simple well, Helvetica. Which, let's, let's try Hobo, actually. Oh yeah, let's try it. That, that would be interesting. Okay. Uh... Hobo, Hobo, Hobo. But yeah, that no, makes no. me wonder, like, introducing... Okay, so yeah, I, I feel like for me it's like kind of in the middle. It's like I can... It's better yeah. than Papyrus, but it's it's not as readable as uh, Helvetica there. There you go, or Helvetica. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I feel like some, some of the letters kind of smush together a little bit. To where that, that's why, like, yeah. it, it, it kind of annoys me, like, if I'm... You know, you come up into the console here and you're, like, coding some stuff. It's a little bit hard to kind of see, like, what, what you just typed. Um, oh so yeah for example there's like uh, there's this line this is stealing a lot of stealing and sometimes they're scary hairy and you can sometimes see like the i uh, with the r it's like mushed together sometimes and some bottoms like yeah yeah definitely try to hide from each other like some it's like the big letters they're like super easy and understandable but the small letters kind of blend together it's like yeah yeah i originally went with went with that just because it to me it sort of looked like organic a little bit like you know someone like making little letters out of clay or something um you know you look yeah. like uh, yeah it does fit like this s sort of looks like someone like bent a little piece of clay <laughs> you know it's kind of like the kind of pointy end uh so that, that was kind of the motivation is to kind of get something a little yeah organic looking um and yeah i feel like it, it's decently readable especially at larger sizes um but yeah it could be good to maybe just have get a, some variation or you know some like kind of simpler font in there for Maybe in-game text or, or something, maybe something with like a hint of like organic clay roundness to it, but but yeah. a little bit more Helvetica-like. Yeah, there are people who even have struggled with pixel fonts, so it's it probably may not be like you probably see why typography is, is a science. Kind oh of. yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, part of me is like, why are these people so obsessed with fonts? It's all whatever. I'll just read. <laughs> show me the text. I'll read it. But as as we can see, it does make a difference. Yeah, in readability, speed, style, everything, basically. Yeah, totally, totally. But yeah, from a technical standpoint, I definitely need to uh, do a little bit of cleanup. I know, like, there's, in the Ballistica API, there's, like, a get text width function, or, you know, there's a few little things for working with, with uh, text, but they, like, all of them just make the assumption that it's the same font. <laughs> so, like, that stuff would have to be revised somehow to just be like, hey, this is a chunk of text with a certain font. Now you can get its width or whatever. Or there's like the right, there's the very limited like big text, which is, you know, just for like the, it's literally just like the A through Z, <laughs> like capital. Oh, yeah. and, you know, alphanumeric basically, it, just for like the big, big announcements. Yeah. And, and and when there's like custom, like strange uh, characters, it just switches back to Hobo to not scare people. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, always, that was just always my... get scared when it when it's in Hobo and not the textures. Yeah, <laughs> that looks pretty bad. But it's like it it's yeah. I I had to do that at some point when I added like Unicode support. Oh, yeah. It's like uh, I obviously can't make a a cool. <laughs> like texture containing it and all that stuff or well that goes back to like if it would be possible to make uh you know some automatic texturizer thing that could make some cool thing that looked convincingly clay like out of like any arbitrary character then you know then theoretically that could get plugged into whatever font and make like large large characters that looked cool but yeah it's kind mean, of a challenge theory made but make for example here like the easiest way would be probably to have like a clay texture just overlay on top of the font yeah and if you want to go real real forward you could for example separate because this is vector art right you could have like a vector that differentiate between fills and strokes and then have the strokes have like a different texture than the fills and then you can have like clay that naturally begins and ends 
where the font is and that could work but yeah that's a lot of work and i don't even know how to approach it <laughs> it does seem like a fun project like make i feel like i could jump into something like that for like a week or two or you know something just make an automatic clay yeah. <laughs> character thing uh, just trying to make yeah because like, yeah. i feel like you'd want to like waver the edges a little bit like almost like you're showing with your screen filter for your your game you're, you're oh, yeah. showing you know yeah. so like i feel like that would be part of it too is like taking like certain like crisp edges and like rounding them a little bit or you know just doing a little bit of like filtering to make it look more clay like well, actually i'm gonna repost it so people know what kind of screen filter you're talking about oh, okay go for it it's probably uh, you're probably talking about this editor like uh, footage where i do a fly, a fly around yeah just something where you can see like all of the edges of the stuff in your game it's just kind of like the way it looks a little sketchy you know like oh yeah that's exactly like I think it's called Scribble Vision by the original Scribble, for that. Yeah, that would be a good. It's like uh, like effect. Yeah, if you look at the edges of the editor window, it's like it's like the entire thing waves, like it's hand drawn, even though it's not. Yeah, I feel I feel like looking at straight lines, like the edges of the doors, yeah, or the camera, yeah, like over here, like. Still, yeah, when the camera stands still, it shakes. So. Yeah. That's the effect. Yeah. So that's a. Stuff yeah, like that, I feel case, like it's... Yeah, but in this case, I'm just taking the, the pixel UV and I'm just moving it left and right or up and down, depending. Okay, so that's just like uh, a screen space uh, thing for for yeah, like everything? Yeah so, yeah, so here's the thing. The, the, the entire screen is a UV from 0 to 1. And what I'm doing is I have a frame-by-frame -frame texture with red and green values on top of it. And I'm basically just moving the pixel uh, to the left, to the right, or to the uh, up and down, depending on which color it is. And I have a multiplier which tells me uh, how much it's moving, and that's it. I also have a mask, which means the closer to the center it is, you don't get red or green, you get black, so it doesn't move at all. For example. Okay. So what? So so if I if you if I showed you what the screen, you would just have like a glitchy green and red mess that will just change frame by frame. <laughs> oh and yeah. And you would have like a big staring void in the center. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I can somehow like visualize it. Let me see if I can if I can do that. In the meantime, we, we can talk about something. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. But yeah, I feel like stuff like that, like filters that just kind of make things look imperfect. I feel like that's just kind of I don't know. To me, that uh, I, love, I love these filters. Yeah. Yeah, I feel. Um, I mean, that's part of the reason I I came to the you know use kind of clay and stuff for the game is just to kind of come at, come at it from an imperfect side. You know, I feel like that's a I think when you're working with computer graphics and stuff in general is that like they're so perfect and so you know antiseptic and clean and you know it it almost looks like off-putting to where like adding a little bit of like imperfection and you know the the random like analogness of the the world to oh. that stuff like I think that that always helps make it feel more like tangible. Oh well, actually one effect that I think it was toned down in the newer versions was the uh, I, I like to call it news real footage effect or a uh, old projector old timey filter it was like much more uh, increased in the open beta versions. And like the screen was flickering more. There was like um, a bigger sepia tone, even more if you're play playing on Happy Fonts map, I think. Oh yeah, and yeah, I used to have- All the newer versions. That definitely used to be more of a thing. Like I think I was mentioning back in the day, I originally was targeting or experimenting with even just running the thing at 24 frames per second to make it look more like film or like some little stop motion animated thing. Um, that yeah. wound up being just bad from a gameplay perspective point, though the the frame rate thing, yeah. um, for like yeah, lag feel. Just... But yeah, I think like I I toned down on kind of like the the strobiness, partially just because the game would get get played in like streaming situations or certain things like that where it almost seemed like that was kind of like hard for, or you know if there's a YouTube video of it or something like it seems like that that kind of like wreaked havoc on <laughs> like compression stuff like that. It almost seemed like just make oh, things a little little clearer for for those purposes. Film grain, especially. Film oh yeah, grain. film grain. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's like you're just kind of like fighting compressors at that point. Um, like I liked how it looked. Maybe that could be an option, just like if you want to play it in super nostalgia film mode. Um, part of me thought too was just like the, as as time goes on, like fewer and fewer people remember like playing video games on a a grainy NTSC TV, you know, stuff like that too. Oh. Where it's like, is this gonna we, we talked about this before like is is that nostalgia going to work on people or is it just going to like confuse people um, I mean, maybe it, it still works oh, by the way I, I, actually I, i'm reminded of that one oh imagine if you play the game 
and you threw someone off the stage and then the game just paused, showed you a pause and it was like, ah, letters in the center. <laughs> like, ah, yeah. And it, uh, yeah. And it turns out there was like a whole community with people doing uh, weird meme Star Wars edits of the entire movie. And there was like a, an edit called the silent film, film edit where every single piece of dialogue is like an old timey style. Like, oh, that's awesome. Like letters, <laughs> entire movie can be watched like this. That is super cool. That'd be fun just to... <laughs> yeah, just make little mini games or something like in that certain style with like old timey dialogue. I can see that for like a little RPG or something, you know, just make, making all the dialogue. I think there's something nice about like having written like red dialogue in those cases. I mean, maybe this is just me like revealing my oldness, but you know, I, I kind of feel like if you read the dialogue, you can kind of like make up what the character sounds like and stuff versus if they, if they have a voice actor, it, it can be a bad voice actor. And then, you know, I don't know. Like, Oh yeah. I, I kind of like enjoy sometimes being able to like partly read the game and, and as, as opposed to hearing it, you know. Um, so yeah, I can see like a, the old timey text actually working working for that. Burr, 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 burr. Oh, okay. So I so I have what the what the screen is looking like, like just uh, you know just the UVs, but it doesn't move at all. So I'm just gonna show you how it looks like. Okay. Basically okay. this. It, it basically you have you have the colors right you, at the bottom uh, the upper left is like zero zero right on the uv mm -hmm. but then you go more forward to the right it's more red you go down it's more green yeah and then you go in both directions it's like the all yellow okay so it's like this but <laughs> mm. you, you can you can't really see, you see it moving which is sad oh yeah this effect is kind of subtle yeah i mean i could boost i could boost it actually i should i should see if i can boost it and see like it being Oh, okay. <laughs> that yeah. looks strange. Yeah, it is uh, slightly mango colored. It does look, looks kind of delicious. Yeah, so here's how it is. Like, imagine this, like, noise. Oh, okay. But it's frame by frame. It changes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's almost uncomfortable, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah, if you're just looking at this noise here, it's a little bit, like, feels like you're going to get a migraine or something. It's like yeah, this, this weird blob of color in the middle. Like a static... And you're seeing a static screen. Oh, I'm gonna show you the texture, like the displacement texture that actually like moves everything around. Like you might not even believe that this is the same, like that this is what the effect actually does. Let me see if I can find it. All right, programmer, yeah. I saw your, I'll, I will jump on this after in a second. My third library billboard. Oh, it's squiggle, squiggle vision. All right, texture, I found it. Now let me just open source location. I'm just gonna yeah it is strange like I think I showed it it before but let's see if I did Ooh. that's the texture <laughs> like cool. it doesn't tell you anything huh <laughs> yeah. it's like a weird drapes pattern yeah interesting and, and uh, could you believe this is actually like a frame by frame animation this is four frames of animation mm -hmm. yeah you just separate it by like four squares top down uh, top down top left you know stuff like that and you basically go uh, top left, top right, uh, bottom left, bottom right. And okay. that's the animation and it loops. Oh, and, interesting. And, and each color basically tells us how much, how, how much I should push the pixel to the right, to the left, up or down. Yeah. And the intensity determines how much. Cool. And, it, and it's not just a random pattern because it's like a wavy effect, but oh, sometimes yeah. a bit noisy. It's like, it, I kind of wanted to make it like look like, oh, I'm going to um, send how it looks like with one character in game. Actually, if you... If you scroll up with the with the footage in the editor, you can actually see the characters like shaking in a wavy pattern. It's like kind of similar, but not really. Like it, it's not it's not totally random. Definitely, I wanted to make sure that it's that it's uh, you know uh, a pattern that is like it feels hand drawn. It isn't just like random random pixels moving about. Like it has rhythm. It, it is a wave. It's a pattern, right? Yeah, it seems like that way with a lot of things like film grain and stuff. Like a lot of people think it's, oh, it's just random noise, but it's like sometimes you need a little bit more kind of cohesive shapes to, to make it feel right. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times. I just... posted a second video with a character, and if you look at the character itself uh, at, at the bottom, uh, there is like a, uh, like a special like move way. So it's like frame by frame, but you can still see like it's shaking in a specific manner. So I don't have to like draw more characters. I can I can just let the shader do the work for me, Sweet. and the effect is still there. So it makes it easier for me. 
Shout out to my cousin here talking about some some huckleberry. This is our like inside joke. Anytime we find huckleberry, the word huckleberry anywhere in the world, we, we comment on it. <laughs> I almost ate at a restaurant called Huckleberry uh, this last week, Michael. Uh, I, I, I would have sent you photos, but I wound up going to like Taco Bell instead or something. I'm so sorry. Yes, so there was this guy talking on YouTube about the bag with food shows. And uh, there was a guy that, sh that shouted Huckleberry or something. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, if you see. That was named that or something. I don't know where we, we started on the Huckleberry thing. I think we we're, yeah, Cousin Michael visited me in San Francisco and we just started talking in like a Southern accent and just everything's Huckleberry. <laughs> so it's, that just became a thing. So ah. I need to get some like Huckleberry uh, Easter eggs in the game somewhere too. Along with like, you know, submarines and our, our, our growing list of, of random game memes. Um, all right, before I forget, I was going to go answer this. Oh, where to go? Burp, burp, burp. Programmer was oh, asking. Yeah, about API 8. So uh, yeah, it's been a while since I've kind of, I know I was rambling a bit about this before, but I'll, I'll go over this real quick because uh, I know it's probably confusing to, to folks, like basically how things got split out in API 8. Um, so basically, so everything's split out into these feature sets and um, I'll just go over like what each of these feature sets are. The whole thing with feature sets, again, is like they tie in with the spin-off system to where basically we can rip out an entire feature set very easily. It's like totally self-contained. Um, so uh, the main feature set, well, the, well, I'll start with core. So core is basically like the very bare bones, like this is for like bootstrapping the engine, but like core is in charge of like getting Python running and stuff like that, which is like, um, there's some stuff that you use in core, but not, not a ton. It's, it's supposed to be kind of, you know, as small as possible. Uh, but then most of the engine is base. So the base feature set is, um, you know, this is just, like graphics, events, audio. Uh, this is all the stuff that is basically the engine, but it's not specific to Bomb Squad or anything else. Uh, I mean, there is still some bits that are kind of effectively very Bomb Squad specific in here, um, but it's supposed to be, you know, game agnostic. So if you're dealing with, yeah, you know, any if you want to take a look, yeah, the audio engine, the graphics engine, the OpenGL rendering, uh, any of that stuff is in here in base. Um, Next layer is, so these, in a way, these are kind of the same, like scene V1 and classic. Well, I'll just start with classic. Classic is just kind of a dumping ground for any functionality that is kind of specific to old Bomb Squad or, you know, Bomb Squad as it exists currently. Uh, so, like I said, it's just random stuff that, um, that we need to keep around to keep old Bomb Squad running. Um, but which is probably, you know, I wouldn't suggest using this stuff in, you know, going forward when, when you can avoid it. Uh, that, that's all going to live in classic. Um, scene V1, so scene V1, this is all gameplay stuff. So basically anything, you know, anything with like nodes or, uh, you know, anything specific to what classic Bomb Squad is, this is all scene V1. Uh, so if you come in, um, a lot of like the networking and stuff too. So it's basically just all of like the gameplay related stuff. So basically creating little simulations with the nodes and running all that logic. And then also like sending that out to other game clients that all kind of goes through here. So like connection sets, um, yeah, loading. Well, those are like scene assets. So, you know, just like basically the building blocks of, of gameplay. Uh, the big thing is, yeah, like nodes are all in here. So scene v1 node, blah, blah, blah. Here's all the node types you can create from Python. Um, yeah, and that is, so that's called scene V1 because theoretically for uh, like squads mode or moving forward, we'll have different scene versions like scene V2, which will have a maybe similar, but somewhat different set of nodes with different attributes and they might, you know, work a slightly different way. Um, and that way we can keep scene V1 just like doing its thing and classic games will keep working. Like I said, scene V1 and classic are kind of... They're kind of intertwined. I maybe should have just made a single uh, feature set out of those. Um, but yeah, that, that's what that is. Uh, shared, this, this is the one bit of code that is not actually part of a feature set. This is just like common things that get used everywhere. Um, and so like low level stuff like, like shared foundation. This is like the object class that everything inherits from or like the event loop. Um, it's, you know, technically some of this stuff could have lived in base probably, but um, but yeah, it's it's not really in its own feature set. It's just kind of like, yeah, common shared stuff. Uh, template FS, template feature set. This is basically a bare bones feature set. If you want to kind of like get into how feature sets work, 
Um, take a look at this one. This is basically just, it doesn't do anything. It's not used anywhere. It's just kind of like a example of how you could create a feature set. Um, and UIV1, this is just all UI stuff. So this is all the existing UI code lives in here. So again, this is sort of, in a way, this is tightly tied to scene V1 and classic and that like it, all the classic gameplay stuff kind of lives in these three places. This is the UIs for it. Scene V1 is the gameplay logic for it and classic is like miscellaneous bits. <laughs> um, so yeah, I hope that helps a little bit. I know it's um, probably a little bit of like looking around can you, cause everything used to just be like the BA module and then like <laughs> bastard BASTD. Um, but yeah, it's just been split apart a bit. So I apologize for making you all go, you know, look for, look and find things that you knew where they were before, but hopefully things shouldn't have to move at this point. Um, uh, like I said, for moving forward, scene V1 will probably stay where it is. And then scene V2 will just get added on top. Eventually, once we're up to like scene V45 or something, scene V1 might go away at some point in the future. So, but we'll, we'll have this kind of kind of overlapping list of, of feature sets. So that's, that's the plan is, you know, new stuff will get its own feature set. Eventually old feature sets will get retired, but they won't, there won't be as much like things just changing under people, hopefully at this point. So I hope that helps. Uh, anyone have any questions about that? And also a feature set, it's kind of spread out. Like there's feature sets will have, you know, there, there'll be something under source, which this is like the C++ portion of all the feature sets. Also under assets, assets, badata, Python, each feature set will have its own little uh, Python package in here. And then there's also one other place under like meta. Each package can have its own like meta source. So you'll see these all have like names corresponding to the feature sets. Um, and if you want to see which feature sets are actually present, you can just do, it's under config, feature sets. Like this is where each feature set is kind of defined. So there's a little bit of, a little bit of random info about like feature sets and how they relate. Like you can set the feature set, like this, this is the plus feature set, which is like the little closed source one that has like the you know, account related stuff and stuff that I, unfortunately I have to keep that little bit uh, closed for, for security reasons or, or whatever. Um, but anyway, this is still like defining it. So it shows like, you know, you can have a feature set that relies on other feature sets and there's little different things here. Um, so yeah, and again, once I get like a, hopefully I'll get a nice tutorial on the spinoff stuff, which will go into this. So basically if you were wanting to, you know, make your own little, little spun off game or app, you could uh, basically strip out all the feature sets, maybe keep like scene V2 or scene V1 and then, you know, add your own little feature set that would launch that as a game or something or app. I don't know, different different ideas are possible. Um, or for like uh, making like the Bomb Squad remote app, I'll probably just make like a feature set, which is just like the remote app portion of it that might like share code with the, the on-screen controls that are already there. <laughs> I know this probably, this probably sounds all complicated and probably looks all complicated too. I mean, it, it's, it is kind of complicated, but uh, yeah. But yeah, this, I mean, if you're, um, if you're like modding the game, you know, most people really don't need to worry about this kind of stuff. It's more just like, just know a few things. Like if you're modding the game, instead of using importing BA, you'll import like BA scene V1. Um, usually it'd be like import BA scene V1 as BS. That's what most, most uh, gameplay code does. If you come into uh, source, assets, but data, Python, BAC and V1 lib. Oh yeah, and there's other, um, so BAC and V1 is like the gameplay API. Then there's these other feature sets too, like BAC and V1 lib is just a library full of stuff that uses that API. So that's kind of what BAS did. The BASTD module used to be, the, the standard library, basically all the actors and game types and all that stuff. Uh, those now live in these little like, scene V1 lib is, all that stuff. So it's a bunch of like activity types, bunch of actor types. Um, so this is mostly just like Python scripts that like tie things together, like creates a, a spaz actor out of, you know, a spaz node and possibly other nodes too, like sounds and various, various things that might come into play or creating like little text nodes, you know, when things happen. 
<clears throat> uh, so yeah, that's bacnv one lib. But if you look at any of this stuff, like actor, if we come into like bomb here, like this stuff all uses, you know, import bacnv one as bs. So that's kind of that's why like there's no longer a single like ba module that contains all this stuff. That's this is kind of how the versioning works. So. So stuff that would be written later for like scene v2 that uses like a slightly different stuff, it'll be doing like import VA scene v2 as bs or import VA scene v35 as bs. Um, and so that's how all this stuff will kind of have its own like namespace and be able to like exist independently is by just having these like slightly longer ugly names. Um, but you can still use them, you know, with short names like this. You can import it as, if you want to import it as ba, then some of your old code might work, but I'm just, I'm doing BS just for nostalgia purposes. Uh, buttons and menu screens. So that, that's all uh, UI stuff. So BAUI v1 library. So this is like the library of UI bits. So if you want to see like anything related to, you know, settings, here's all the settings UIs, like the, the game gamepad config UIs, gamepad settings window. In this case, it's, um, so my convention is anything using the scene stuff. So this is gameplay stuff. I'm just importing BACMV1 as BS. It just stands for like Ballistica Scene at this point. Or the UI stuff, I'm just doing BUI. Uh, that's, like I said, you can import it as whatever you want or you can use the full name. Um, I'm just using using these just to make the code a little little tidier. Uh, but yeah, all the, all the UI stuff is BAUIV1 lib. So you should see everything here that was, this stuff used to be under the, the BSD slash UI. Uh, yeah, so yeah, scene v1 is all gameplay stuff. So yeah, spaz nodes and all that, that would be BA scene v1. Oh, no, not, so yeah. So the scene v1 library itself, this is like kind of low level bits. And then just, this is like, concrete things like actor types and game types that use those bits. So theoretically, like you could write something that uses BAC and V1, but then just like replace BAC and V1 lib with like your own set of stuff. You know, if you're doing like a, a total conversion or something, you might just like throw out BAC and V1 lib. Um, so yeah, spaz nodes and stuff, that's all under actors, like spaz. There's spaz, spaz or spaz bot or spaz factory, like these, these few little things that kind of work together. One thing I would suggest, like if you're if you're uh, modding a lot or coding, is you know get a get a good like project wide search functionality going. You know, just something where it's like if you if you knew where something was before, just have a convenient way to just search for that text, and you'll you'll find it somewhere in the project. Like I do that all the time. Like I I know that things are big enough where it's like I can't remember exactly where everything is, so I just I try to. Well, for one, I try to name things with like names that I'll, you know, if I were looking for this two years from now, once I forget where it is, like what name would I think to search for? Uh, you know, then you can just find like weird, what weird corner it's been tucked away in. But yeah, you'll see a lot of stuff up here. You know, it's just BAC and V1 lib that, that used to be like bastd.actor.bomb. So yeah, hopefully uh, once I'm done with this 1728 kind of cleanup stuff, hopefully I'll be getting started started on uh, yeah wiring up BAC and V2 or probably the the precursor to BAC and V2, which will probably be uh, I keep joking about text based RPG. So it'd be like BA text based RPG. I don't know. I have to come up with some little little fun name for whatever that temporary little feature set is. Or maybe it won't be temporary. Maybe people will love making little text based RPGs and everyone will just play those online. So yeah, hopefully I didn't, <laughs> I didn't bore you to death with lots of dry technical info. Any other questions about API 8 or the, you know, the, this current update or anyone running into weird stuff? Like I said, I am uh, getting to the point where, you know, in the Mac version, I'm, I'm starting to make little, little checklists for myself of like what needs to change before I release it. So 
Um, so if there's any little bugs and stuff you come across that affect like all versions or whatever, I know there's probably not too many like Mac people out there, but the good thing is a lot of the bugs in the game, if they're happening on, you know, Android or uh, Windows or something, they're also happening on Mac. So I can just kind of look for bugs everywhere. Um, but yeah, it will be kind of starting to get close to polish mode here soon. I know I, I need to get the Android version working again before I can consider it to be polished, but, but yeah. It would be interesting to play with like Unreal Engine and stuff like that. There's part of me that thinks I should just like take a month and just go play with Unity or Unreal or Godot or whatever, you know, just to see how they do things. Though, that, though I also worry that I would be like, oh, I'm doing everything wrong. I need to rewrite everything. And I already do too much rewriting. So that might slow me down even more. Can someone make an app that uses V2 accounts to store data and link them to accounts and stuff? And if so, Ah, uh, this goes back to, yeah, I need to do like a REST API or, you know, something where people can start to do, I mean, I would, I, I, at some point I want to make it possible to, to store kind of custom data with your V2 account. Um, I just need to like define that in a clean way so that it's not easy to like steal data from other people's accounts and things like that. Um, hmm. But yeah, there's not really any documentation on that as of yet. I mean, my, my hope is to just start wiring up basic uh, squads mode stuff, which will completely like depend on V2 account stuff. And then, you know, it would kind of fall out of that. Um, uh, Bomb Squad would be still available in Windows 8. I don't think so, unfortunately. I think it's basically dependent on Windows 10 at this point. Um, a big limitation there, if you want to check it out, is Python. So we, we're trying to, I'm trying to keep the game up to date with the latest Python, which currently is, well, actually we are a little out of date right now because Python 3.12 just came out. But, uh, oh, maybe Python still supports, or yeah, maybe it's Windows 7 we don't support. Maybe it still supports Windows 8? That is a good question. Anyone have Windows 8? <laughs> like, it's unfortunately not something I can test because I don't have Windows 8 handy. Oh, okay. Well, um, have you tried the latest test builds? Like, are they working? Yeah, it looks like so Python has officially cut off Windows 7, but I guess Windows 8 maybe is still okay. Oh, it's not? Uh, is there a particular error you're getting or anything like that? It's one of those things where um, I'm not like explicitly trying to cut off Windows 8, but if I'm using something that requires Windows 10 and I don't realize it, like I can see that being not working. There's not too many Windows 8 people out there to where, uh, you know, I, I'd like to make it, you know, if I can keep it working on Windows 8, that's great. But realistically, I don't know how, how long that can happen. I could see like Python 3.13 cutting off support for it or something like that. But, but again, if there's like minor things that are making it not work and we can fix that, I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, yeah, it wasn't, it seemed like one of those, like Windows has a thing where it's like every other version, everyone loves it or everyone hates it. You know, like Windows 8 was one, seemed like one of those down versions. <laughs> like Windows 7, like everyone hated Vista or like Vista got so much, much hate when it came out and then Windows 7 came out and everyone loved Windows 7. Then Windows 8 came out with like all the, the tablet -y stuff and there was like all the backlash. And then Windows 10 came out and like undid all that. And it seems like Windows 8 was kind of the, that slightly unloved version, so. People are kind of speeding through it, but but again, if there's if there's no technical reason that we can't support it, like we might as well support it. <laughs> but yeah, see, see, there's some Windows 8 hate. I am kind of bummed. I cannot. Um, I I can't actually officially run Windows 11. I have uh, my old PC from like 2016 or tw or no 2015. I don't know. Whenever it was, I got that, but it will not run Windows 11. So. Um, so that means I'll probably be supporting Windows 10 for a while <laughs> on the upside. But I, I kind of wish I could test on Windows 11 just, just because. Yeah.
Yeah, Windows 11 does look nice. I feel like they, they cleaned it up nicely. Ping fail. Uh-oh. Oh, um, I would like to support this whole, like, idea of, yeah, like, using your, yeah, V2 account or logging in with your V2 account, sort of like the, um, I just need to, like, be secure about it. Like, the, um, yeah, so if you want to ping me offline, like, maybe, maybe we can start to get that ball rolling a little bit. You know, I, I'd love to, like, longer term, that's something I'd love to have is just, like, I definitely want to keep V2 accounts secure and be very careful with them, but you know, there's no reason that people couldn't, you know, use them or, you know, if you're logged in with your V2 account that you couldn't authenticate that way with like a website or something or, you know, just to prove you were you somehow. <clears throat> yeah, Windows 11 does look a li yeah, a little little Mac like. I feel like that happens, like, you know, Android and iOS, they copy each other, inspire each other. Windows and Mac, they kind of go back and forth. And... Oh, interesting. Yeah, part of me thinks it's good that I'm stuck on Windows 10 just because I will... Uh, Keep that supported for a while. That is a nice thing about Windows. And we were talking about that earlier, how it's sometimes like on the Steam Deck, even though the Steam Deck is Linux, it's easier to run Windows stuff because Windows is so good with like backwards compatibility. Um, I mean, part of that is like they're, you know, basically Intel processors going back as far as you can remember and all that. Like there's a lot of stuff that hasn't changed, but they've done really good about like, you know, keeping old stuff runnable on newer versions of Windows. Uh, you know, like I said, it's it's tricky with Linux. You know, if you're building something on a newer Linux, it just won't run on other Linux distros unless you build it in very particular ways, or you know, you you spin up an old version of Linux to to build it on there. But yeah, Windows that seems to be less of a less of a thing. Ah, uh, yeah, keep me updated. I I unfortunately don't like test the uh, the WSL build path all that often. I mean, I'd love to keep it working. Um, but yeah, I, I don't like, I never know like if WSL is like changing under us and stuff like that, or if, if there's certain things that like stop working or if we could add things to like CI testing or something. Like CI testing has been so awesome. Like I'm, I'm so happy that I've kind of embraced that uh, with, let's see right now. Oh, it's so green, look how green. So I still have like my Jenkins server, which is, uh, yeah, just running all sorts of tests on like all the platforms. Um, so like whenever I, you know, whenever I'm tweaking code, I'll be, I almost consider it like a save point every 20 minutes or something. I'll just like check that into Git just because then it'll like build it on Windows and Linux and Android and iOS. And you know, like it, it, it shakes out so many bugs like so quickly where it's like, oh, I wrote something in a way that it works everywhere except it breaks, you know, under Visual Studio or whatever. So it's nice to just, you know, once you have a little like CI check in there, then it like forces you to like keep working, keep everything working everywhere. Um, I never realized like how handy that would be until I finally set that up. I was wondering from first place, which one is better, Windows or Apple or Linux? That's, oh, that, people don't get passionate about that at all. It's like, what's better, Super Nintendo or Sega Genesis back in the day, I remember, you know. The, um, I like all of them, but I know everyone has their, their probably favorite platform um, or Android versus iOS or whatever. I don't know. People get so like passionate about their, you know, th their team, just, you know, human nature, I guess. Green? What? what, what? <laughs> oh, Android is wonderful, but iOS is wonderful too. They're all wonderful. I'm just happy that like, I'm happy there's competition. I um, in most of these spaces, it's like I I kind of 
sort of remember like the slightly bad old days. I feel like for a while, like Microsoft had a monopoly on, you know, operating system markets and like Internet Explorer, like that was all anyone used for browsing. And I feel like that led to a little like stagnation and like there wasn't, there wasn't much competition at the time or something. So I, you know, I, I love uh, in, in the mobile space that it's, you know, sure there's just two teams. I wish there, I kind of wish Windows Phone was still a thing. But I, I feel like at least there are being like two healthy uh, teams, you know, team Android, and team iOS that are, you know, very competitive with each other. I, I feel like that's good for pushing things forward. Or same with, you know, you know, there's not a ton of Linux people out there and Mac is still way smaller than Windows. But I feel like there's, there's more competition in the, the OS market space these days. So I think it's good overall. But yeah, some people, I mean, I'm, I'm just as guilty as anyone, I think. You know, I was Team Super Nintendo back in the day. Uh, I had a lot of friends on Team Genesis. So it's, you know, it's super easy to get very passionate about, about the home team. Yeah, I never, never played with a Windows phone. I, like I said, I feel kind of bad. They they fizzled out. I wish they had kept at them or kept at them or kept them, uh, gotten them more competitive. You know, it seems like it could have been good to have three players in the market instead of two. But yeah, unfortunately, it seems like some of the earlier ones, like they really sucked. And then they, they I feel like they, from what I read, I, I never used them, but it sounds like they got them a lot better. But at that point, it was almost too late or, you know, there just wasn't. I was talking to friends who did like game development or app development and they were saying like Microsoft was being very generous with app developers, like paying them a lot of money to like bring their apps to, to Windows Phone and stuff. But it was kind of too little too late at that point. It was like all the all the apps were already on Android and iOS. And so it was just kind of like just couldn't catch up at that point. At this point, I feel like it would be like impossible for a new I don't know how that would, uh, like, maybe somehow it could happen, but you know, like a, for a third company to come in and like have any chance at, you know, competing. I know like Amazon tried to launch that, you know, their Amazon phone, their Fire phone, which was, I mean, it's technically Android, but it's like, you know, has their own flavor of apps and, you know, they doesn't have Google stuff on it. And, you know, they, they kind of, that failed pretty hard. <laughs> so it seems like it'd be a, a very, very difficult market to get into. Shucks. Yeah, Microsoft, I feel like, again, they do great stuff. I love the, you know, talking about Windows being like super backward compatible and, you know, obviously all, most all gamers are on Windows. Um, but it does seem like sometimes they're unfocused or, you know, like with Windows Phone, it seemed like they kind of like half-assed it for a while or, or certain things like that or for, for like coding on Windows, they have like these new sort of platform, like the Windows App Store, and there was like the unified window, some like API where you could write write stuff for Windows and it would run everywhere. But then they kind of didn't really support that as well, and everyone was like using their old like Win32 APIs, and so it's a little bit like I feel like they're not not always great at following through or like sticking to their original vision. I guess Google is guilty of that too. Sometimes is you know they they like change course every year or something and like messaging apps and certain things like that where it's like I wish they'd like pick something and stick to it. Yeah, like I feel like Google gets like ridiculed for this at this point. I mean they do great stuff like you know everyone still uses Google for search and Android is awesome but but yeah it does seem like they have certain like app initiatives and things like that where they just kind of they they don't follow through as much as they could. Oh yeah Google Plus. <laughs> There's, I think if you dig through uh, if you dig through the Bomb Squad assets, I think there's still a Google Plus logo in here somewhere. Uh, it might be on like one of the icon sheets. Assets, data, textures. Let's, ha ha, <laughs> oh, there it is. It's still in there, Google Plus. All right, I should take that out and save like one kilobyte of space in the game. Well, there's, there's a few things. There's a sign in button. Cool. 
yeah, they were they were all about that Google Plus there for a while, like really trying to push like all their apps and stuff. They were trying to wire it up into like everything possible. Oh, here's on speaking of graveyard of dead stuff. Here's Game Circle. This was Amazon's uh, thing. I finally had to like stop supporting that. I feel bad because I think a few people probably lost progress or something because they, you know, were just using Game Circle uh, with no other like logins linked. Oh yeah, there's an Nvidia logo here. There was, uh, there was gonna be like Nvidia was gonna release the game on some console in China or there's some something or other where I was working with Nvidia on something, but I, it never really. Like it sort of like fell off the radar at some point, but I, I still, there's some sort of NVIDIA account icon in here. Burr, 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 burr. Or that might be, uh, that might just be on the font sheet. There's a lot of random stuff on the font sheets. Like font extras. There's <laughs> random icons and, and things. I need to finally make a new font extras sheet at some point. Just been rocking these, uh, these four for a while. Oh, there's some extra space on this one. I haven't noticed that. I know. It is a little bit weird, like Bomb Squad being like an old game. There's so many uh, so many little things it's, it's outlasted. You know, the, the most recent of which is the, the, the poor, poor I, I arcade behind me. Um, I don't... I think, oh, the, yeah, I think there was like one graphic in here for like the IA Arcade stuff, but I think I, I took that out. Yeah, there's still, yeah, like the treasure chest and stuff. I, I still do plan to use the treasure chest. Um, that will come into play for squads mode, um, which, yeah, I'll, I'll ramble more about that. But yeah, I, I, I threw a few things in there without, you know, having an immediate need for them. Well... It's my plan is to have like yes there will be like boxes but I don't it's not going to be like the kind of loot boxes where you just like pay to get more boxes it'll be more just like stuff you win my plan is um, that it'll be be purely stuff you win for through gameplay uh, but it, it'll still be loot boxy and that like if you're using the free version of the game it might just be like a timer to unlock or something like that but I don't want to do like the super sleazy, like, oh, pay $30 for this shiny box and keep doing that until you get something cool. Like I, I, I want to like have a line in the sand where it's still like, you get this through gameplay, um, but you know, maybe the free to play part is just avoiding some annoyances. Um, I, my, I really want to try to make the free to play stuff to where it's not like, just doesn't feel like it's encouraging you to just pay, 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 pay kind of thing. I don't know. I feel like some games do that well, you know, where it's, it's like staying on the right side of that the, the sleazy line. <laughs> yeah, squads and bomb squad. Like, what could we call these groups of things? Uh, maybe <laughs> teams. Uh, yeah, what? Well, I originally, I mean, the original name for it, like the party system, which was gonna kind of evolve into that, but it wound up being like the party system is basically just like public servers, so it's kind of stupid to call them parties. But they're they're called that now, so it's. Um, but originally, my plan was to like evolve parties into kind of what squads mode is going to be, where it's like less about joining a server and more about just like gathering groups of friends into your party and then playing games. That's why the the, the section was called like gather and not like net games or join net games or whatever, because there was originally there was like the Google Play thing where you like you could invite someone to your party and stuff. So it was a little bit more like what squads is going to be. Like I said, now it's just a little bit of a misnomer. It's just kind of like, it's a name for, for joining network servers. Um, but yeah, part of me thinks I should just rename that to servers at this point, because it probably is not gonna pick up any more like party kind of functionality. It's just gonna be, uh, you know, it's more just like net games. <laughs> equip the squad in the game title that'll be the only way to get there it'll be like super secretive you have to know you have to click it like five times and then press like up up down down left right no um do people still know the konami code is that a thing like on that random uh like that was the the big <clears throat> you know the original contra back on nintendo back in the day up up down down left right left right ba ba start okay yeah it's 
just making sure that's still there. Or, I didn't know if there's like other codes that, that people know very well that have like replaced the Konami code or something. I vaguely, I, I feel like I used to know like the, the other big code in my life was the, the blood code for Sega Genesis Mortal Kombat. Cause that was, you know, back when like the Super Nintendo version was all censored and there was no blood and stuff when the first Mortal Kombat came out. But the Genesis version had that like code you could enter to like get blood and gore. And so I feel like all the, all the cool 13 year olds knew that code. Even though I wasn't the Genesis person, I still knew that code. But yeah, I think I forgot it at some point. What's Picasso code? Oh, <laughs> Da Vinci Code. Ah, oh, yes, the Da Vinci Code. But yeah, it will be interesting. Um, I, you know, I do want to like kind of start chatting with folks about like the monetization stuff and you know getting the the weird little like boxes, whatever sort of boxes they will be kind of getting in them, getting them in there. And I do, yeah. This is kind of the the hope is that it'll basically be like online play, and if you win a match, you get a box, you know, stuff like that. Um, I mean, boxes will probably just contain mostly, I don't know, tickets or something like that at first. Maybe there'll be extra little, little stuff in there or something. I feel like there are upsides to having kind of slightly surprisey little boxes full of cool stuff. It's just, you know, the downside is obviously if you're just being super sleazy with making people pay bajillions of dollars for them or whatever. Custom full screen console, system keybinds, please. Uh, we, yeah, we, I feel like we should start talking about that. It'd be great. I feel like at least for now, like coming up with an easy way to mod that kind of stuff. Uh, like what I've been doing in this version at least is like really kind of simplifying the code that, it, like the C++ code that handles key shortcut stuff. So if you go into like Ballistica, base, input, input.cc, this is like where all that stuff comes through. And so it's definitely gotten simpler. So there is a key. Somewhere there's like handle key press, blah, blah, blah. Oh, there we go. Handle key press, probably this. Oh geez, what did I do? So you can see there's starting to be like more commented out code here, but yeah, this is, it's not actually too big of a thing where all key press come, all key presses in the game come through this function. Um, so it handles a few things, mod key states, full screen toggle, pasting, dev console toggling. So this is like the, the few things in the game that are kind of hard coded. Um, plus, minus, F5, whatever. So you can see there's not a ton here. So I, I feel like we should, like maybe the right thing to do would be just like to like route this all through Python and then just have some place where like plugins could like add their own things or, you know, where people can kind of start to mess with this in an easier way than, than coming in here. Um, that probably like, even if we routed all keys through Python or maybe like only unhandled keys, like maybe there would still be like some certain hard coded things here, but then if that wasn't handled, it would like send it through Python and then you could do whatever you want with it for like toggling full screen or something. So that sounds super awesome. <laughs> I don't, uh, adding RGB keyboard support. Yeah, I'd, uh, th so this gets me thinking of like what sort of ecosystem would be good to like support people doing stuff like that themselves. Like, cause this is something where like, I don't have an RGB keyboard but I'm sure somebody does. And like, if it was easy for them to like add support for it, uh oh, Roadmap Seagull. <laughs> like, yeah, if it was people, or that would be another upside of, like I said, getting scriptable key bindings to where, you know, people could come up with a plugin that would just like give you a super cool UI for like making key bindings do whatever the heck you want. Uh, you know, so like, I'm, I'm just trying to think of like what kind of infrastructure could we put in place, to like encourage cool stuff like that. Or, uh, yeah, like RGB keyboard support. I'm trying to think like what, 
what like callbacks could we expose that people would need for this? And then people could, you know, write drivers or, you know, little, little scripts to do whatever they want. Uh, or this also like, like one thing since I've been working with the new uh, game controller support is, I, it is long overdue to just get Rumble support in there, you know, for a lot of these systems expose that. Like I knew that, I know that like the Apple game controller stuff makes that pretty easy. I think SDL does too. So that would be super cool is to finally get some rumble support in there. I'd never really bothered with that before, but like that would be cool. Uh, but yeah, this is all, I don't know, this comes back to the, the tricky challenges. Yeah, it's like I, I need to get 1.8 out the door, just like focus on the, the, the features of that, um, you know, the <laughs> downloadable assets and starting to get squads going and stuff like that. So it is, uh, it is so tempting to get like sucked down these little tangents. Um, but that's where I'm trying to like, I'm trying to think more of like how to structure things where, it, like I said, where it's like scriptable, like making things scriptable and then like you folks can write cool stuff for it and it's not dependent on my limited time. Um, like I still enjoy just, you know, kind of working on the game on a small scale um, as opposed to, I've talked about this before, like why I think it's, I enjoy just working on it myself and kind of keeping it as a small thing uh, for like the creative freedom and just for avoiding, you know, I don't have to worry about monetization that much you know as long as i can like pay my own bills like we're good um so you know that's the upside of keeping it small scale the downside is that you know i am very much a bottleneck so it's uh so that's that kind of leads me back to like why i'm thinking about like how can i make things more moddable or make you know empower people to add rgb support <laughs> the keyboard RB, rgb support or another thing like yeah there's you know those like lights you could have on your wall that like would react to the game or something like someone wins a match and then, like the lights would go crazy or you know like that'd be super cool <laughs> though i am glad yes we can all enjoy one 150 fps on our uh on our 60 hertz screens in case you need to warm up your room a little bit you can just get that gpu going and that does on that note it, it i wouldn't call it a wake-up call but like seeing what these unbound FPSs are, you know, people, people getting like thousands and thousands of frames per second, it makes me think like, oh, we should do some slightly fancier shaders or something. Um, like one thing, uh, it'd be a super fun little tangent is just like an ambient occlusion pass. Like that would be something that wouldn't really require a bunch of extra infrastructure or coding. It would just be like a cool shader pass to like make everything a little bit more nice looking. You know, you see where things are intersecting and touching. Um, you get the cool like soft shadows and stuff like I, I don't know. Part of me wants to spend like two or three days and make an ambient occlusion shader just for like higher graphics mode, you know, something like that. Because um, there's still I don't I don't want to make the game like require fancier um, you know graphics hardware because there's still a lot of like low end Android phones and you know with with phones in general it's like even if it can push fancier graphics sometimes it's still nice to keep them bare minimum just because you know battery life is such a thing um, you know phones will even if it can run the game okay after playing it for five or ten minutes it's gonna like throttle down and like or get hot and so it's like the it's still useful to be able to like you know keep things as lightweight as possible but for the people with the fancy gpus it would be really fun to just yeah go go crazy with it or yeah ray tracing oh man like oh that'd be that would be definitely a bigger endeavor is ray tracing support. I know I've talked about that, but that's starting to, I'm, I'm starting to kick that idea around in my head is like how I can restructure the renderer so that we can have like a, a completely different renderer that is just built on ray tracing, you know, just something like that for the, the, the crazy hardware people. Especially starting to trickle down to phone hardware. It's like, I, uh, you know, I'm being in a, an Apple Apple guy, like their latest phone, like has basic ray tracing support in there. So it's like, oh, that'd be fun to play with. Um, run on 30 FPS. Oh, no. <laughs> Does anyone run on 30? I know it, like, that's a weird thing with consoles and stuff is that 30 FPS is actually pretty common for games. But like, I feel like 30 FPS just drives me nuts. Like, if I'm playing something at 30 FPS, to me, it looks totally like jerky. I don't know. How do you guys feel? Are you like 60 FPS purists? Windows 8 explains a lot. Oh no. Oh no. Yeah, it is, it is weird because like 
going back to uh, originally, I was writing Bomb Squad to run twenty four FPS, like just like a movie, just to have, give it like a film look, like which looks, you know, movies look like movies. That's cool and all, but but you see twenty four FPS in a game, and it's just like, oh, that game is struggling. Yeah, it's weird to have we different have like different aesthetics for for different things. But yeah, what was it? There was like City Skylines 2 or something. There was some, something is in the news right now. They're talking about like, it's getting a lot of hate for like struggling at 30 FPS or something. Saying they, they have like two high, high poly models or something like that. But yeah, something like 30 FPS, I feel like is right on the edge of like, okay, it's playable, but it's not great. But if it's only running at 30, yeah, I feel like it's gonna drop into like 10 or 20 sometimes too. And then I feel like that just gets like, ew. <laughs> though I feel like there's a I mean 60 is nice I feel like 120 looks nice you know like I can tell the difference between 60 and 120 it's uh, you know it's like a nice to have sort of thing I've, I'm sure like if you really look closely you can probably tell the difference between 120 and 240 um, at some point it becomes like I'm sure like a yeah diminishing returns sort of thing it's like people with like 8k TVs it's like how many people can really notice that or, or it seems like on, on phones, like resolution, it kind of stopped becoming a thing. Like phones at some point stopped like advertising like how high res they are. It's like you can't really see the pixels anymore. I mean, it technically, I know like people get into this debate about like, oh, you're, the human eye can't see beyond 100 FPS, but like depending on how the game is rendering, you know, like a thing I always do is like, even if my monitor is 120 hertz, like move your mouse in a circle like this, like you can still, you can still see the individual images it's drawing. Like you'll still see like each little individual cursor. Like it would have to, you know, it, 60 looks better than 30, 120 looks better than 60. I'm sure 240 looks better than 120, but I feel like you'd have to get up until, you know, like the thousands or something before you'd stop seeing individual cursor images there. So like your eye can still, even though it doesn't probably look, most things don't look different, like your eye is still picking out those individual images. I mean, unless the game was like rendering your cursor with motion blur or something, then maybe you wouldn't, maybe you wouldn't be able to tell at that point. But, but as long as like we're still rendering individual little projectiles, like once per frame, like you can still, you see a trail of dots, you know what I mean? Like even if, even if your game is rendering, rendering 500 frames to your eye, like you'll still see like a dotted line. All right, well, we're just about two hours here, so I've actually been rambling for two hours. What the heck? <laughs> it feels like one of those, like, oh, there's nothing to talk about days, but still, two hours is gone. Uh, so, yeah, I guess I will wrap it up and stop rambling for, for today then. Get back to my, my Mac checklist here. I'm trying to see what am I going to work on today. Maybe, I don't know, one of these. Command key names and controller button names. Those are, uh, that's super boring, but it needs to be done. Maybe I'll do one of those. Yeah, I think so. Like in general, I, I feel like you probably would not notice most of the time 240 versus 120. Maybe, maybe you would. I feel like I can mostly notice 120 versus 60. 60 versus 30, definitely. But yeah, it does seem like it's a point of diminishing returns. Like I was saying, I feel like there's very specific circumstances like where you could you could still notice individual frames. Like you kind of your eye would sort of register them. Like I said, like the your cursor, like spinning your cursor in a circle, but that doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean a lot. So, all right. Any last thoughts, comments, concerns, poetry? One point eight when um, as soon as possible. <laughs> I, yeah, these uh, one point eight has definitely been a story of slight tangents. Like the one eight one seven twenty was a, a huge change, like ripping all that stuff apart. Um, this one seven two eight has been quite a change, which cleans up a lot of stuff. It's been good. I'm glad I did it, but it's definitely delaying one eight a little bit. So. Um, yeah, once once one seven two eight is back together, then I need to yeah just finally. 
get these last bits of one one uh, one eight done the asset packages and all that stuff so yeah it's still it's not you know it's still a little ways off but getting there favorite bomb squad mod oh I can't even answer that like you honestly like everyone is there's been so many fun mods we've played and people are doing such good work like I don't have a favorite it's and even if I did it's I feel like it's uh it's one of those things where like if you have a favorite child you're not supposed to tell your other children you know so it's like I feel like you know I would I, I shouldn't say even if I did have a favorite <laughs> but all I'll say is like y'all are doing awesome stuff and so we should yeah we should uh, line up to if anyone has any you know cool updates we should line up some some play next next coffee <laughs> two seconds per frame yeah you can like watch it rendering that's always good I'm like on frame rate just to go off on that for a second like I, yeah playing like GoldenEye on the Nintendo 64 back in the day like I'll still occasionally get together with friends like we'll someone will have an N64 and we'll wire that up like four player split screen and my god that was so choppy it was like it was literally like 10 or 15 frames per second it was and but we liked it darn it <laughs> but it's like that is so like unacceptable now I mean it's kind of fun to like bust it out from nostalgia but it's like oh my god this is not this is too choppy to be fun What's this? <laughs> oh no. what? I love the random videos. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. Well, on that note, I guess I will be. Oh, geez. We're getting. I'll have to save that topic for next time. Celebrity male and female category. That's a complicated question. It's not even like favorite favorite celebrity. Anyway, all right, heading out. So, been fun, everyone, and talk to you all next time. So, peace out.